Hi, this is Peter Cook. As a lifelong golfer and winner of this year's Jane Mansfield Desert Classic in Las Vegas, I'd like to show you some of the ups and downs of this remarkable game. I'd also like to introduce you to a few of the colorful characters I've met on the tour. Ah, it's a cruel mistress, golf. Hello, good morning, golf fans. Welcome to the fun fest of golf. I'm Chief Secretary of the Anthem Room. Thank you very much. Golf. There is no beginning, there is no end. Nineteen seventy was a tragic year for my dog Hamish. She died of a, a broken heart. There's there's no other way to describe uh, what she died of. I was carrying for Doug Sanders, a nice enough American if you if you like that type of American with uh, purple pants. Anyway, I warned Doug that um, one of the things about the course to beware of were ants, which were attracted to highly coloured trouser wear. And uh, he had this little putt to win the championship. That's my advice, and I said, Doug, beware of the ants. One of the little killers could go right up your leg and bite you on the body. I said, the putt is simple enough, but the ants are the ones you have to cope with. He shuckled around the ball, looked at it this way, looked at it that, came to putt. The ant got him on the backside and the rest is history. Well, of course, we have to laugh now, but it shows you that you should rely on your caddy, his local knowledge, and what an ant can do at the height of a championship. you can see me trying to console Dougie. I said, Dougie, 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 look at Nicholas's trousers. Nice conservative grey, ant-proof at that time of the year. But no. You see, basically, I tell all my players, there's only one thing you have to know about putting, and that's hit it firm. If you don't hit it firm, it will never reach the hole. Uh, Bernie Langer, who I happen to like, you know, could not convince him of this particular aspect of the putting game. Now, if he had three hands, he'd use them all on the putter. How often do they take my advice? Very seldom. Bernhard looks like he's having a, a positive, whirly gig of a dance on this particular green. I call them hair langer, of course, to make them feel at home. But it uh, made no difference. Took no notice. A stubborn bastard. Never mind, what can you do? It's only a game. 
I'll never forget the day that uh, that Japanese guy, Tony Nikajima, took seven out of the bunker. He said, that, what, what do I do with this bunker? Not in that particular accent, but uh, more of a Japanese vein, really, to it. And I said, um, all these bunkers look alike to me. I said, do what you like. Have the five shots. I said, he said, should I open my face a bit more? I said, why don't you shut your face a bit more? You'd have to tell them something. Seven shots to get out of a bunker, you know, took two to get in. <laughs> I think he committed suicide, but it um, was none of my business. Didn't tip. I used to love the course, Hamish. Loved to run free all over the fairways and in the, in the rough and in the bunkers, startling little animals all over the place. Now, of course, he's gone. He's dead, as we say in Scotland. Lee Trevino, that was a player I quite liked, actually. quite liked Lee Trevino. At least he beat Jacqueline. Anyone who beats an Englishman is all right in my books. Hamish is part English, or was part English, but I've had that part replaced. Hamish! Hamish, come here! You might put Mr Trevino off his stroke. Hamish, you daft bugger! Come, sit! Sit! Don't chase hairs. Oh, Lord. Hamish. Oh, muchos sorrows, senor. Hamish. Hamish, leave that hair alone. Oh, Hamish. Remember the time we had a, a rabbit barbecue in the fifth? I went back to the wife. She said, where have you been? I said, I'm in the bunker with Hamish having a barbecue. She said, oh, I like that chance. I said, I happen to have a Polaroid of it. She said, oh, yes, who took it? That big girl from the pub. I said, no, Hamish took it. I said, how come he's in the photograph, then? I said, Hamish's friend, Hamish. She didn't believe a bloody word. Now, you see, the secret, the secret of good bunker play is perfect balance. And Lee Trevino was brought up on a beach. You'd think he'd know about it. Similarly, we Gary player, you'd have thought he knew how to keep his balance, but no. Because it's a terrible thing to fall over in a bunker. You never know what might have been there before and what it might have left. Hamish might have left quite a lot. This is pre pooper scooper days. If Hamish had been there, that. Uh... That little cat would not have disturbed this distinguished young Spanish golfer. <coughs> it's a very unsettling thing. You see, our cameraman has to lose focus for a while because he's overcome by the, the stench. Ah, St Andrews. I must have walked the course a million times with the likes of Bobby Jones. Always an amateur, Bobby. Gene Sarazen. Max Faulkner with his strange, strange truces. <laughs> it brings back the memories. There's only one thing you have to know about the road hole at St Andrews. Which is this. If you're going to play it, play it well and take the right club to the green. Now, for a start, you don't want to go into the road. <laughs> but old Tom Watson, would he listen to my advice? I mean, the night before, I said, for God's sake, Tom, don't go into the road. Well, he forgot. I went straight in, took the wrong club and let that uh, nice young Spaniard, Sevi Osvitarius, do his little dance of triumph on the green. I told Tom afterwards, I said, you didn't heed me. I forget what he said to me. But uh, there was a great deal of force in it, I remember. 
But Seve and I, we go back a long way. I speak a little Spanish, you know, ole and hola and buena sera, senorita. And um, I'm very glad he's married now because he wasn't then. Still, you learn a lot on the golf course. But Tom Watson, I, <laughs> I know his family came from, where was it? Um, Loch Nictre. Loch Nictre, I think his family escaped from in the 18th century. And he loves coming back. Whenever he comes back, I always say, Tom, remember the road hole? <laughs> Laugh. No, not really. Ah, it's a cruel mistress, golf. And a horrible wife. Not even a decent date. Not even a one night stand, but I've been in golf all my life. Golf is my mistress, is my wife, and is my secret lover. I couldn't believe it when Tom took the three iron instead of the four that uh, Alfie had suggested. I mean, Alfie and I were in complete agreement that it was a four iron, but look what happens when a golfer doesn't listen to his caddy. Oh, that's so many laughs. You don't need radio or television or pantomime or visiting yodelers when you've got a memory like that to keep you entertained on a cold night. God bless you, Tom, wherever you are. I hope you're not here. <laughs> Otherwise, I might have to remind you yet again of that, that particular shot you made against my advice. Here's to you. Oh, I've had some laughs over the years. Well, three, actually. No more than that. When I first learned golf, there was only one club that we ever played with, the Wiffy. About that long. No, uh, no head to speak of. Just a stick, really. No balls. We never had balls in those days. We just played with any old... any old dead bird we found on the course. Hit it with a Wiffy. I went round in 183, round the old course at Troon. There they are, the great triumvirate, Varden, Braid, the other fellow. Nice ties, good costumes, just two clubs between them. I can't really say I hold with all this space-age technology, the stuff they bought back from the moon, Teflon-coated butters, titanium-shafted spoons, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm not fond of that element of the game, because golf is nothing if it's not about a man with a stick of wood in his hand hitting a ball towards a hole. That's what golf should be. Of course, golf has a future. Courses are spreading everywhere like wildfire. Cameroonians, for example, the Cameroons originally came from Scotland, of course, uh, they're taking up golf, and uh, tribes of them are playing golf. They've got no courses, but they'll have courses very soon. And Iceland, so far, without golf courses. Antarctica, so far, golf course free. An ideal holiday home for somebody who wants to get away from golf, but for how long? Soon the husky will be replacing the caddy, and the sooner the better as far as I'm concerned. It's a dog's life, I'm telling you. A dog's life. Still, who's to say that one day a pygmy won't win the Open Championship? I mean, we've been close enough before. Pygmies, people from Kathmandu, people from countries we haven't even heard of yet. Emerging places. I saw a young amateur on television played for Chad. Very, very promising. Beautiful natural swing. A Chadite winner of the open stranger things have happened and many many races will play that great game that unites every country in the world g-o-l-f it's spelt but to many it should be spelt g-o-o-o-o-l-f especially if you happen to be a pygmy with a speech impediment, you might call it goof. And of course, talking of nudity, many naked golfers will appear in the future with beautiful bodies, young women with no clothes on, will be swinging away through Perthshire and Ayrshire and possibly 
feeling exhausted, might pop into my place here and say hello to Hamish and enjoy a wee dram. Hello, good afternoon, golf fans. Welcome to the Fun Fest of Golf. This is a human skeleton. Well, not an actual human skeleton. It is a, it is a tiny skeleton which has been modelled on the basis of a human skeleton, rather as this golf club has been modelled on the basis of a golf club. See how the golf club fits in this skeleton's hand. My purpose is to show you, for all that I can, the scientific and psychological principles of the golf game. For example, here we have a sheep's head. Not much use on the golf course, not much use for anybody at all. But on the other hand, looking over here, what do we discover? We discover the skeleton of a fish. What can we learn from the fish? What should we learn from the fish? Should we learn anything from the fish? I will come to that later. Over the next several hours, I'll be demonstrating how, in psychological terms, the, oh my god, another skeleton, this time rather larger than the other one, but also in no shape to play golf. So, the principles have been laid down. This fish, by its very nature, is in many ways unsuitable for the rigors of the golf course. What one has to understand about the fish is that no fish in history has ever completed 18 holes on a golf course because they do not survive out of the water. So that is why I throw this away now and describe in more detail how the human body and the reptile body acts. Now let's have a wee look at the professor's swing here. You, you notice his, his body is completely still and his eyes never leave the fish. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a human body. There's the head, there's the neck, there is the legs. And the hands, of course, come down in front like that. Now, to show you the difference between the human and the fish, I'll draw the fish in a blue color rather than the red. The fish is more like that, you see, and with a big tail like that, and a fin here, for example, just like the fish I was showing you earlier with an eye here, and of course an eye is the other side, which you can't see, but nobody can really make much of that. But if a fish takes a golf club like that, with um, his uh, fin, and the man takes a golf club like that with his hands, you see the strain on the back of the man as he swings it back. There is pens here, and of course the fish only has to go like that, and no strain on the back, it, it goes straight over like that. So, okay. the back is a vital part of the anatomy of a first-class golf player. And that is why no one should ever try to do drawings like that, cricking the back, because this one solid motion through, through, the, um, through, the, um, through the pancreas, back, cocking the wrist, and never wristing anything else, of course. But uh, this is not a golf club, of course, because it would be too dangerous with all these Bunsen burners about. Bunsen, of course, being a German who invented the burner in the old days, I think around about 1876, Herr Bunsen von Düsseldorf came up with this very nice burner, which, as you see, burns perfectly well. But I stray from my subject. You see, the fish, uh, uh, once again, I use the blue, blue crayon. The fish here has not moved at all, but the golf swing of the fish is through the ball, under the water, over there. There's the man, poor soul, I should put on some nice shoes made by, I should think, Foot Joy, one of those firms, probably with nice comfy spikes in it. Always remember to get the spikes the right way down, towards the ground, never stand on the shoes, because this causes great pain on the back. And here we have perhaps the ideal animal for golf, the penguin, intensely sociable, well-equipped and beautifully turned out. And what about the supple Gregus Normanis, denizen of the dip? So we take our minds back several billion years when the earth was just mud. Then out of the sea crept these little fish, according to Darwin. And who are we to make doubts about Darwin? He's probably quite right. Anyway, the fish jump out of the sea and suddenly they develop these little legs. You can see on the this fish we have here, which is very, very old. 
probably 14 billion years old, preserved in lava. And here, after the animals, the fish develops the legs, the animals decide why not jump around up and down the trees. And so the first ape, the first hairy ape, the simian man, begins. Here we have an actual skeleton of one of these early men who jumped up into the trees. And we can see from the skeleton that his backside was central to his centrifugal sense of balance. We now see if you place a club in his hand, and of course early man always had a club with which to gather all his meat and fish and things like that, he could hit a little ball just like that. But he was not searching for little balls, early man was searching for little early women. Now, that also places a strain on the back. Whereas the fish is completely happy swimming around in the sea, but as soon as it gets on the land, the pressure on the back becomes enormous and you look how ill and seedy the man is compared to the fish who is almost in perfect health. What can we learn from this? Practically nothing. We learn nothing at all. About the game of golf, however, we learn a lot. For the fish has no sense of humor, the man has a sense of humor. This is why the man took up golf and the fish neglected it. And here we have a classic example of the sense of humor. Young Colin looking very cross, but it is only to amuse the crowd. He throws the ball away. Here we have another young man breaking up his club just for fun. And Jose Marie, well, what does he do with the ball? He kicks it. <laughs> One cannot help giggling just to see the sheer joy of the game as he chucks the ball away. And Brian Barnes, Barnesy as we call him, moving sideways like a crab. What could be more amusing than that? <laughs> and so we see the young Nick Feldo jumping up the tree with all the the grace of a gazelle and all the, all the charm of a, of a, of a Nick Feldo. And look, who is going up the tree now? Why, it is the determined Bernhard Langer. He is going to hit it out the tree, no mistake about that. Go on, Benny, give us one for us. <laughs> And here we see yet again one of the many faces of Colin Montgomery. All of them exactly the same. But what charm. Colin, by the way, is no relative of the other Montgomery who had such fun in the desert with Robert, the desert fox. And now what is fell to the fun star to? He's going his head around. It's a no end to the gags from his golfer. My, ha, ha, ha. What a funny yoke. So, as a doctor, I am often asked, what is the perfect combination for the ideal golfer? I have to say, you have to take half a fish and half a man. Ideally, the brain of the fish and the heart of the man. We need the spine of a conga eel for its flexibility. We need the strength of a gorilla in the wrists. We also need, of course, a certain amount of charm a little haha -ha machen, as we call it in Germany. You know, the ability to make people chuckle with joy just to see him play. And that goes for the women as well, because women are an important part of the new golf scene. Men and women mingling together forever and ever, wandering around the earth playing golf. What a future. I went to just a, a few minutes ago. This, this room was filled with uh, jovial, jovial companionship. Um, a selection of, of bankers, of industrialists, of uh, market gardeners, accountants, people in various service industries, that, that type of thing. Now, of course, it's, uh, I'm the only one left. I'm just left here thinking about the day I've had today. I arrived here around about what, 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast, and um, That was bloody good. They do a bloody good breakfast here, actually. They have all the old, um, all the old, um, all the old breakfast stuff. They have um, haddock, have um, peas on sticks. They've got uh, bits of um, bits of bacon, poached eggs, and uh, just just nice gentlemanly fare. 
And well, they stopped selling breakfast round about, um, round about, um, round about three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's the time, of course, one, one tends to think of uh, popping out onto the, onto the course to see everything's in order, because um, one of the great difficulties with a golf club is just keeping things, keeping things all pleasant, because the members like to, like to come here and uh, not be anywhere else. And uh, we, we had a lot of trouble with, with golfers coming up with their clubs and their uh, bags and their stuff like that and uh, trying to get onto the course and uh, playing golf. Which doesn't really suit um, most of our members who prefer to, um, to relax, to talk about the, the meaning of life and to um, avoid getting mobile phone calls. But uh, every now and then, every now and then we, we do have the odd um, person who is a member. To become a member, one has to really sort of um, pay a lot of money. And then they think they're entitled to go out on the course and start hitting these awful little balls about. You see, nowadays, they've got absolutely no idea of the game. It's this Spanish Rivero chap is playing off, playing off the roof. Oh, we didn't put the roof there to be played off. Look at this, cars all over the place. Uh, and we, you also have, we, we play the line of sight rule. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a, absolutely clear, isn't it? Line of sight rule. Uh, you take the nearest, nearest point giving you complete... Awful relief, little no car there, isn't it? Right. That's correct. It's all very well asking for complete relief, but I don't think they're likely to get it. I mean, why not just hit the ball forward with a croquet mallet or croquette as the uh, women used to play it? I mean, it's all about stance and posture and breeding. Uh, look, at, look, look at that fine figure of a man or a woman, whichever it is. And Sir Francis Drake single-handedly held off the armada by standing still. And standing still is still one of the most important parts of the game. Golf in the old days was uh, based on a very, very sound tradition that there should be somewhere in the world where one could just go to in the morning, have breakfast and stay till, um, and stay till dinner, and then stay on after dinner because it's too far away from home to get back. I, I happen to live about, about 18 inches away from the clubhouse. It's a long, long, long walk at, uh, at my age. So I, I tend to stay overnight and um, my wife can always be in touch with me by, um, by um, arranging a meeting sometime or other, uh, which we can put in the diary, and then we can meet. Um, not here, of course, not in the uh, not in the um, the antler room of the um, of the club, because this is perversely, I suppose, in this day of uh, PC, as they call it. This is an area which um, is uh, women free. I mean, I'm perfectly in favour of them bustling all over the place and doing, doing jobs and things, but uh, when they start leaving uh, their balls and uh, clubs around the course, it gets on your nerves. Uh, not, not that we don't have women members. Every uh, February the 2nd, there is a meeting to uh, discuss the possibility of women uh, existing. And uh, I think they do. I'm, I'm fairly convincingly persuaded that I'm... Uh, married to uh, some such thing. But under the rules of golf, you'll notice no mention of, of um, women as such. And um, far be it from me to interfere with the rules of golf. They're enormously long, um, as indeed is my wife. She's a huge, uh, huge creature, towering up to about seven foot and uh, could make a very decent living as a basketball player. But um, we've, been, we've been very lucky because we have a working arrangement. Um, she works and I arrange things here and uh, we're very happy. She tried to get up the game, but that didn't suit her, didn't suit her at all. I think the uh, armed response unit at the club may have put her off. Apart from February the 2nd, when of course they're very, very welcome. I mean, you can see what happens when uh, you allow these women in, they go berserk, basically, showing their respect. Whereas this, this, this young chap is just high spirits, youthful enthusiasm, and of course he's easily removed by the uh, 
security people. You see, the trouble with the, the modern game of golf is all, it's all dominated by money and uh, sponsorship and slogans all over there, knickers and everything like that. But I mean, when I was young, we had the, the great players. We had, we, had, we had Cotton, we had Varden, we had, we had Silk, we had, uh, we, had, um, we had armchairs, actually, in those days. We used to sit in those armchairs and just think how well people behaved on the course. None of this all arrogance strutting around, surrounded by people willing them well, saying, yo, and in the hole, and all that stuff. We just, we just if we ever watched golf, we, we watched it from the comfort of, of, of this particular window in the, in the antler room, where well-behaved men of a, of a certain age would, uh, would wander up and um, hit the ball in a courteous manner. But nowadays, we've got these, these well, I can't think of another word for it, hooligans, hooligans, hooligans on the, on the, on the courses, all jumping around asking for quiet. Why should we be bloody well quiet? It's our bloody club, isn't it? Don't, don't, don't tell me to be quiet. The fact that it's the, the open, as you so-called call it, doesn't mean I have to be quiet, because I'm a member here. I'm Chief Secretary of the Antler Room. Thank you very much. This, this young man starts taking offence just because members are walking by, um, looking at him, and uh, Suddenly he gets cross, for goodness sake, it's a golf course. Members are entitled to wander around it. Yes, there go two more good friends of mine. I started him smoking, that young man. And here we've got this uh, young James, James Mark, or whatever he's called. Oh, look, he looks so cross just because some members are wandering around the course, as is their right and privilege. This is what they paid 40000 to be a debenture holder. Stop it! For God's sake, we're trying to sit alone in here. They've got no sense, these, these young players. They wear Bermuda shorts, Bermuda tights, covered in sort of little spangles and things like that. Why can't they wear a tie? Nice, long trousers, braces, belts, metal jackets, all the old stuff that we used to wear when we played golf in the Ryder Cup. Ryder Cup. It's never one I particularly enjoyed because it just meant going out and losing to the Americans until we got all these, um, all these spids in from the continent who, who started winning it again, which were made it very disconcerting, because in the old days you could just go and read the newspapers, we lost the Ryder Cup, and then suddenly we're winning it again, and who's we, and is it the Swedes, is it the Spanish, is it the Dutch, is it the English, is it the Scots, is it the Irish, who gives a toss? The fact is that we play the Americans, we lose, and then they bugger off home, as far as I'm concerned. We do have Americans in the club as recreational artisan members, um, provided they, provided they uh, dress properly and uh, call me sir. Because at the end of it all, when you think about your arrangements, you, you have to consider yourself. And I've never considered anything other than myself. And I've considered myself for a very, 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 very long time. Always as, always as long as I've existed. And uh, I've come to certain conclusions, but I'm not willing to share it with a camera. I mean, you might have Esther Ranson around any moment and telling me, what were you doing in Morocco in 1948? It was none of your bloody business, Esther. I was in Morocco, well, I'm not going to tell her. I was in Morocco looking at the beaches. The fact it was, in fact, the beaches were covered with little boys in tiny bathing suits. has nothing to do with my visit to Morocco. I was doing a, a brochure for, um, for, the, um, for the golf club because we wanted to see what kind of sand we were going to have in the bunker. And naturally, I went off to see what sort of sand we should have. And um, I saw some sand, and all these little boys uh, were lying down in it. And I said, well, when we, when we get back, to the club, we'll, we'll, um, we'll take this sort of sand as a sample. Uh, I said, just, just because we've gone to all this expense, might as well take a few of the boys in the bag as well. We still have the same sand, and we still have the same boys, but they're somewhat older now, and, uh, but they're very loyal. Nice chaps. Good blokes. I 
if I if I stay here in the ante room, a lot of people come up and ask me my views on women priests, and uh, on the whole, I said, good heavens, I mean, there's no particular reason why a woman shouldn't be a priest or why a woman shouldn't be a woman, but that's not the, not that's, 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 that's not the issue. I mean. <laughs> Look, look, look what happened to the Catholic golf circle when they started having um, women caddies like uh, Fowler had his, the, his the fanny woman. Now, no, no, I've got nothing against her. She's a strong, fine caddy. But do you, do you want a woman distracting you from, from the, from the, from the, 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 the the other bit of the stuff that you're doing, which is, of course, the game of golf. I talked to the Pope recently, just just on the on the telephone, because he can't get here as often as he used to, and uh, asked him about the future of the game. And uh, he's uh, not a not a professional player. He's a professional Pope, but his view was that golf would eventually become. The, the goal of all mankind. And when he used the word goal, of course, he didn't mean it in the footballing sense. He meant the, the, the achievement of golf would be a beckoning to everybody. Todo el mundo, he said, which was surprising since he's Polish with that bad hip injury. But um, I see the future of golf this way. No particular sponsorship, just beautiful lynx courses with beautiful sunshine flooding down on them, onto which we can look out of the window from here in the antler room and see, listen, listen young boys striding, naked if they wish, and naked if I wish, all over the links, unencumbered by clubs or costume or all that, all that, all that stupidity which surrounds the game. Just young lads in the nude, wandering round from bunker to bunker, from course to course, but all in view of the antler room here. I see the minimum age of the boys as being one. And of course we'll have high handicappers as well, up to 16. But beyond that, I, I would be unable to form a judgment without meeting my committee of Moroccans who are waiting next door. Of course, there's always a future for the seniors tour, but um, I see myself more as an adjudicator than a participant in that particular type of event. And um, as I say, young lads, young lads running around, stop naked. That's the game of golf for me. Hey, Frank. Frank, I can't hear you at all. Just switch to channel 16, would you? No, I'm getting MTM on this. I am on the third. I said I'd be on the third. And look, put me through to Willie. Oh, is Willie there? Is anyone there? Involving Payne Stewart. Yeah. Payne Stewart apparently has hit a ball and uh, some broad and uh, they, 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 want to, they want to shoot it. So get your ass over there, will you? Will you? No, I can't hear you either. So don't blame me. Blame the company. I'm in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now, Frank. Uh, making a martini, right? It was supposed to cut. Terrible bad luck for you. There's the light. Right in his pocket. <laughs> so even with all modern technology, if I lose contact with Frank on Channel 16, I've lost contact with Frank. And anyone can lose a ball, but it's important for the modern player to know exactly where he is, especially here in sunny Scotland, home of the game of golf. If you lose your balls, never mind, but if you lose yourself, that's what counts. Here we are right here. But we even 
spend too much time on the map because should we get lost by any chance, we can always we can always resort to um, the, the, the flare, which every golfer keeps uh, in his bag to to signal to those in control. The flare, the sex stand, of course, a wonderful old instrument. The sex stand, you just you just look through it and. There you are, right on the other end of it. And uh, should the sextant not uh, avail you anything? The, the telescope. Again, we can peer through here and see every aspect of this beautiful moose-haunted fraternity of the veldt. And should that fail? If the telescope fails, we have the satellite dish. This little baby here. This little thing will boom me in right to the hotel, room 108, my favorite number. <laughs> should have some wires on here somewhere, shouldn't it, Harry? Just to update you on the bug stats, uh, this little sucker is about one-eighth of an inch long, and here we have uh, a young Spaniard, Jose Maria Olazabal, no doubt troubled by a three. 3.5 kilometer wind left to right and uh, a number of bugs which of course dwell and hibernate in the water such as this. Nobody's best friend. Of course, golf being that uh, strange, crazy game it is, the, the ball can literally land anywhere at all. It can land on the ground, as you see here, or it can land in the water, in which case the modern caddy comes fully equipped with this fireproof water equipment, this uh, beautiful rubberized titanium style wear. But of course, the ball can also fall in a little pothole anywhere you like. In which case, modern caddy puts on the hard hat with a little electronic device and just goes looking after that little sucker as fast as he can. And should the ball fall, into murky water, then we are reduced to the aqua lung and the wading boots. The modern caddy has no trouble just fitting into these. I, I find them a little difficult and they don't really match my costume as well as I would like. Now, it takes a lot of, a lot of guts to get under water that filled with, uh, filled with, uh, with gators, with uh, piranhas, with, uh, all type of uh, mean creatures and, and John Daly here up to his knees in that most dangerous substance water which uh, is something which he has recently adapted to they say that uh, trees are made of up of 90 percent air well try telling that to young Gary Levinson from Europe England as he as he attempts to struggle out of a position which uh, even Charles Atlas would find difficult to accommodate because the rules are the rules and it's a jungle out here. So here we have the entire modern golfer's bag, the, the folding clubs, the irons, the woods, the shears, the, the old-fashioned ginty. Some of them like to use this old Norwegian club from way back when you had to hit the balls off fjords and hillocks and that kind of thing. And every golfer is superstitious in his own way, and here's a lucky rabbit's foot. Alas, the craftsman has not detached it from the rabbit, but that can be arranged later. I'll get on to Dave about that particular aspect of the game. I remember in the old days, people played with live rabbits, which uh, was a tricky art. You had to get the rabbit right back behind the shoulder. Ledbetter still uses this as a, a training tool. Just swing the rabbit through the hips, around the body, over the shoulder, think of God. And stop at the bottom of your swing. Bad luck. Uh, many a player, such as Bernhard Langer, will average round about um, seven and a half hours or, or days to complete the round. And uh, Joachim Hageman from uh, that fine country of Sweden, he likes to reinforce his um, internal fiber with a mix of protein and uh, essential trace elements, such as the, um, I'll just get one here, we have it. The old tried and trusty pineapple. Uh, pineapple, there's nothing so nourishing as a pineapple. And uh, the modern pro and the modern caddy carry the pineapple and the machete 
Nothing beats the Teflon coated machete for just hacking into that pineapple. And then while Bernhardt is lining up his shots, uh, you can just have a, a real good old chew of the, uh, of the uh, pineapple. Pine Apfel, I believe they call it in uh, sunny old Germany. Okay, so, is that the new bodybuilding? So. It is. Can you hurry up and hit it? <laughs> <laughs> well, what can you say about this guy? He ju he just has such fun with the with the crowds and the crew, and uh, he just he just relaxes and uh, enjoys himself. All right, great, yeah, terrific. You have to admire the man. Oh, I gotta have another one. <laughs> Another fine contender on the tour is Ayane Woosnam from uh, the Duchy of Wales, the principality thereof. And he likes nothing more than a fine old Welsh <laughs> cottage sandwich and uh, a coconut just to keep his, uh, keep his adrenaline flowing. Similarly, you just use the machete on the coconut, get out all those lovely spices and juices. You can hear the juices flow. And of course, a little crackling on the side, well, that's Craig Stadler's particular little caddy speciality. Yes, it's a, a barbecue with a few chickens, a few sausages, and uh, some buns. Because when you're playing with Joachim or Bernhard, you have time for several meals between the shots. Yeah, well, if uh, food by the music of love play on, that's what uh, the poet said. It could have been Fuzzy Zeller. But apart from food, the modern golfer also needs a little bit to drink to keep his bodily fluids in a constant <laughs> supply. But before he drinks, he needs to sit down. These uh, handy little devices just invented on the floor, which just pull out in an easy fashion. Harry! Providing a nice little seat. Of course, the, um, the modern golfer is not an unsocial being. He likes a, a little bit of this, the old famous Scotch whiskey, well known to Ian Woo's Nam and all his uh, cohorts on the Isle of Britain. But due to the dehydration of the body, which happens in the high temperatures, the, 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 the body needs to be resuscitated with that most godly gift of all, his most precious gift of water. Without water, we're nothing. And with water, we're a little bit more than we would have been. The brain is 90% made of water and uh, Drembry or Benedictine, whichever the hell this one is. Benedictine, now, he was a very fine player. In the 1858 Open, I believe, with um, Hagen Jürgen. But I digress. The important thing about water is you can always get it out of your bag at any time. You can open it up, you can drink it down, you throw it away. You do whatever you want with it. Get some water out, get some water in, because the fluids, the balance, the acids, the pH content, just, it makes your hair look nice as well. We need to be isotonic and we need um, gin and tonic and uh, little miniatures come in handy. I remember on the fifth hole at um, St. Andrews, a quaint little course in uh, Scotland, England, we had a series of little bottles of this and that. Christy O'Connor, that uh, veteran performer, perhaps had one too many Glenn Livy's last night as he puts his way into danger in the bunker. And here we see another very good reason why the caddies always carry around an ample amount of Heineken to relieve bodily difficulties. It's hard to believe that the game of golf is one of the most dangerous occupations in the whole world. More people die on a golf course than on a polo pitch or anywhere else like that. Remember little Mr. Lou from Formosa? Vice President Agnew with his friendly encounter with the voters? Well, that says it all for me. And that must be a tremendous hook. Yeah, veteran broadcaster Henry Longhurst, he put it so well. And uh, this damaged woman is... Uh, almost as upset as Mr. Lou. And here's former Vice President Spiro Agnew with that uh, repetitive swing of his. Um, but not many people realize that he was ambidextrous. And we see him try it another way this time with the same superb repetition of swing. I'm gonna 
Let's try and get in touch with my controller. Frank, I'm on channel 16. Look, I've done the whole bag bit. Yeah. Yeah, have you got anything on uh, channel 23, MTV or anything like that? No, you're breaking up again. I said you're breaking up again. I'll take the damn thing off and shout. When golf falls round, the world is round. And we in the communication business are around the whole time. We can bounce things off satellites. We can bring you golf wherever you are. In the privacy of your hotel suite in Finland, we can bring you live golf from Augusta. In the privacy of your suite in Augusta, we can bring you live golf from Finland. We bring Spanish golf to the Norwegians. In Spain, we bring English golf to the tourists. And we bring Dutch golf to the French, whether they like it or not. In Asia alone, two million people play golf every morning, three million every afternoon. The average German golfer weighs 218 pounds, one pound heavier than the average Finnish golfer. The average Finnish golfer takes longer to finish than the average German golfer who takes four and a half hours to finish getting ready for the game. Golf. There is no beginning, there is no end. There is no middle. Just an endless loop of shots. On and on and on and on. In slow-mo. In fast mo, in medium mo, in mo mo. In oh no, not more mo. Oh God, not more golf, please. For Christ, I can't be doing something like darts. Frank, I think I'm almost beginning to loathe the game I love, the, the game that gave me everything I had, gave me all the friends I ever made, gave me all the, the maids I ever made friends with. Best golf, full of idiosyncrasies, full of...